This is the science of stupid. Warning! Do not attempt to recreate the events you are about to see. Doing so could lead to agonizing injury and extremely red faces. Yes, this is the show that combines science with stupidity. It's where we get to watch a catalogue of disasters. We explore what went wrong and why with the help of such scientific principles as oversteer, centrifugal force and the sometimes painful parabolic trajectory. The rules of science are not made to be broken, so don't attempt this at home or anywhere else for that matter. Get ready to scream. It's the science of stupid. On this show, we'll see what happens when ultimate tensile stress is exceeded. There you go. How to master your axis of rotation. Not like that. And we get to grips with Young's modulus. But first, this. If non-stop fun in the sun is what you're looking for, then look no further than the water slide. And if you're looking to break your back, look no further than the water slide. Go, go. Oh. For a fun-filled slide, the landing is critical. So let's take a look at the science that our fun-seeking friends have failed to grasp. The distance you travel at the end of a water slide is governed by how much velocity you pick up on the way down the slope. Your speed is governed by the pitch, the length, and how slippery the surface of your slide is. But remember, the more velocity you pick up, the further you'll travel. So it's a good idea to soften or slow your landing using water. So high velocity can equal high levels of fun on the way down. But it can also mean a high level of impact if you don't prepare properly for landing. Let's start with increasing that velocity. Yeah, we might well be thinking what you might be thinking. And uh, no, she wasn't travelling fast enough. It's going to be scary. Yeah, it certainly is. Ten out of ten for effort. I'm no expert, but that slope doesn't look steep enough to me. No, it wasn't. This is a novel idea, but you may find you'll quickly build high momentum, helped by the low friction coefficient between the wet plastic of the chair and the slide. Altogether too slippery. Going faster increases the distance you need to stop. That wasn't enough distance. No. Will this guy get it right? No, he won't. Ah, a proper water park. So this couple will be landing in water to cushion the impact. Yeah, that's a slight oversight. So when planning on building a water slide or going on one, it's imperative that you factor in a soft landing. See? child's play. And now here's a middle-aged man giving it a go. Yeah, he became a projectile, but then he wasn't one for long. This is an impact force of 6,000 newtons, akin to a heavyweight boxer's right hook. Let's go back to the loopy lads, see if they can pull off the perfect landing. 
They haven't made the slide any steeper. Their solution is a pickup truck and a bungee rope to increase velocity. Hope it works, because if not, it could really not work. Impressive! That is a maximum 10 from me right there. So successful water sliding is about controlling your velocity to ensure a safe landing. Control. Some people never learn. Mention spinning kicks, and it conjures up action-packed sequences showcasing the dexterity, lightness of foot, and pure power of martial artists, such as these. <laughs> but to release your inner ninja, you'll need to get to grips with some biomechanics. The kicker rotates around his vertical axis. The jump gives him a higher reach without altering his axis of rotation. And the spin gives his muscles more time to accelerate the kicking foot. Bending the kicking leg reduces the moment of inertia which can also increase the kick speed. Remember, to pull off a successful spinning kick means rotating in the vertical axis and not the horizontal. I repeat, not the horizontal. Hey, you weren't listening. Never mind, get up and try again. Go on. There you go, go on. Ah, you can't. This guy looks keen. Maybe he was paying attention. Nope. But when executed correctly, spinning kicks can make an instant impression. To the head. That was an impact force to his head of 2,000 newtons. The equivalent of being hit by a pineapple travelling at 90 miles an hour. In fact, a perfectly executed spinning kick like this has 50% more energy than a conventional kick. So the force generated from a spinning kick is dangerous and should be practiced with extreme caution. Innocent bystanders can become victims. Rehearsing your spinning kicks on tarmac is definitely not recommended. And inviting your mate to take a spin at you is just stupid. 20 bucks says he cannot knock this out of my mouth. Mm, 20 bucks reckons he's just broken your jaw. Once you've mastered the science of executing a spinning kick, please make sure you use it against the right person. Do they have red cards in Taekwondo? Because that is one right there. Here's a daredevil digger driver. But what scientific principle is he about to demonstrate? Did you guess the science this digger driver is going to show us? <laughs> oh my god! It's angular oh momentum. the end of the wheelie, he slams the brakes on and pivots around the front wheels. The heavy gravel in the bucket generates a lot of angular momentum and makes the digger rotate. So much so that when the back wheels hit the floor, 
it continues to rotate around them. This tilts the bucket back and the gravel's inertia means the driver spills his load. <laughs> oh my god! Any good scouting guidebook will tell you when climbing a tree, it's best to stick close to the trunk. That's all well and good until you get near the top and discover the trunk is as thin as a pencil. <laughs> but where there's a will to do something crazy, there's usually a way of messing with the scientific principle. And here it is. As you climb a tree, you're applying a bending force on the trunk. Unfortunately, the higher you go, the thinner the trunk and the easier it is to bend. When the trunk bends beyond its ultimate tensile stress, it snaps. So, if you do find yourself climbing high up a tree, and I recommend that you don't, the main thing is, don't stress it out. <laughs> Here we have a climber reaching the summit of this pine tree. Wonder if he understands the science. His mate's laughing, maybe he does. Maybe they all do. No, none of them did. No. <laughs> the headache he experienced wasn't solely down to tensile stress. A principle also at fault is the turning effect of a force. Oh my God. <laughs> Once the climber is up the tree, Mother Science steps in and applies a cruel twist. A pivot point forms where his feet are. The turning effect of the force he's applying to the trunk means that when it snaps, our tree-hugging friend keeps rotating. But if you thought that was dangerous, things only get worse for the tree climber. If you climb from 10 foot to 40 foot up, you double the speed of your fall and more than double your potential impact force. Yeah. So with science act against you, it's a good job these good climbing where snap cushions the drop. Bit. Or not at all, in his case. But is it any better if you jump straight to the top of the tree? No, it's actually worse. Dude, you broke the whole tree. I, I think there's a kind of cheating anyway. Picture the scene. Your team has scored a goal or a touchdown. Emotions are high. With a glance, you instinctively go to carry out one of the most masculine gestures known to modern civilization. <laughs> this is the chest bump. <laughs> sort of. As you can see, get it wrong and this celebratory gesture can leave you with nothing to celebrate. So if you want to enjoy some unashamed manliness, here's how. For a balanced bump, the bumpers should be around the same size and mass. A run-up builds momentum. And colliding at a harder part of the body means they exert a greater force on each other as their momentum is transferred. So what we've learned is a combination of three scientific factors essential to pulling off a perfect chest bump. Let's take a look at mass. Hmm, the lady is significantly lighter than the man. 
which means the impact she experiences results in a greater change in velocity, narrowly missing putting her head in the oven. Not really, bit of a bump. Next up is speed. If one person has less forwards velocity, then the momentum transfer will make them fly backwards at a higher velocity. So you get the mass right, the speed right. But what happens when your bodies don't align? The force is out of alignment with their center of mass, causing a rotation. Genius! There you have it, the humble chest bump. Not quite a simple celebratory gesture. Your first thought. I missed it! Offering a mate a lift is a kind thing to do, but hitching a lift can be far from hitch-free, especially on two wheels. Riding two up requires the rider and passenger to be in tune with their machine. So to avoid an unexpected parting of company, here's some science. When a passenger is on the back of a bike, the combined center of gravity is moved higher and further backwards. This makes the bike less stable. Add throttle, and not only does the center of gravity shift even further back, but the torque or turning effect produced also tries to lift the front wheel. To prove the point, I've managed to find a couple of lads. Hmm, but the lack of helmets means either they're full of confidence or just idiots. Turns out to be the latter, but you understand the principles here. Now, another couple struggling to keep on the straight and narrow. I wouldn't be leaning too far over to the right, because if you lean a bike, it will want to turn, making it very difficult for the rider to steer. <laughs> Told you. So if two's company on a bike, then three is definitely a crab. Do you think the center of gravity is too high here? Yeah, it is. Or it was. Here's another trio. At least this lot made it onto the road. Really, onto the road. But where did our tricky trio go wrong? Due to overloading, the center of gravity is positioned even further back on the bike. So the last thing you want to be doing is opening the throttle and increasing the torque. Another expensive and painful lesson learned. Ever wondered what a bungee jumper does when they're afraid of heights? Well, it's this. <laughs> this seemingly mindless act is bungee running. But surprisingly, it follows an interesting physics principle. And here it is. To stretch a bungee rope twice as far will require twice as much force. The further you run on a bungee fixed at one end, the more force you'll need to apply to go any further. That elastic energy is stored until your legs can no longer apply enough force and give way. Then it turns into kinetic energy, catapulting you back to the start. This is called Hooke's Law, and is why bungee ropes work so well as an exercise tool. There you go, a strapping young lad, pulling hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, didn't look that good. When the trainer let go, elastic potential energy converted into kinetic energy as the rope quickly contracted. 
Add to this the forward force the young lad was already generating, and... <laughs> Bingo! So, a classic prank expertly executed. But how do you measure a material stretchiness? No, not like that. That's something else. In fact, you use a measurement called Young's modulus. If a material is very stretchy, like so, this means it has a low Young's modulus. Materials with a low Young's modulus, like a bungee rope, will stretch a lot before reaching their elastic limit. As he has just found out. But normal rope has a higher Young's modulus, like this. See? That's science, right there. So remember, a low Young's modulus is stretchy, a high one is not. <laughs> it's a shoe-in. <laughs> That's enough science born through misfortune. Trying any of these stunts yourselves would be ludicrous. So don't say I didn't warn you. Cheerio for now from the Science of Stupid. Oh.